a committee for the 800th anniversary so there's the Father Provincial, Father John Harris, Father Terence Crotty, Father Connor McDonough and myself, four of us, planning for our various celebrations for this 800th anniversary. And one of the things that I proposed was a conference here in Knock on the Eucharist. I thought about our pilgrimages and when we come on pilgrimage, you come normally on a bus you arrive here at maybe 12 o'clock, half past 12. You run and get something to eat. The be ceremonies begin at half two. You're running back for your bus at five o'clock or half past five. And it's all kind of kind of go. And I thought wouldn't it would be lovely to spend a few days in Knock just as a build up for our great celebration tomorrow. Our massive Thanksgiving and the official closing of the Jubilee. And thinking about Knock and the apparition here in Knock, I thought something like the Lamb of God would be beautiful. And what a wonderful title, Behold the Lamb of God, taking those words from St. John the Baptist, pointing to the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And earlier today I was just thinking, you know, St. Peter said on that wonderful day of the Transfiguration, when Jesus brought with them Peter, James and John and he was transfigured before them, a most beautiful manifestation of the glorified body of the Lord on that day. And a couple of days later in the garden, when Jesus was going through his immense suffering, human suffering, he found those three disciples fast asleep. The same ones who had been with them sometime previously and had this wonderful experience of his beauty, you know, missed out. And maybe a little bit like the visionaries or the people from the village here who ran away, who didn't, who didn't stay. And obviously for them, it was almost an indescribable beauty, what they saw and what they experienced here on that very wet and damp evening in August in 1879. I chose to have a look today at the wonderful, wonderful mystic altarpiece of the Lamb, an altarpiece that was painted in 1432 by Hubert and Jan van Eyck from Ghent and Bruges there were, and now today it painted for the Cathedral of St. Bavo in Ghent, and it's now there today. It's a wonderful absolutely beautiful painting. Father Seamus talked yesterday evening and showed us a diptych, so two panels. This is a polyptych, so many different panels in this massive, massive painting. And we'll go through and look at various, various elements in it. But one of the most beautiful um, panels in it is the mystic lamb, the victory of that lamb on, on the altar. And I just want to give you out a little handout showing some of the details of that.
when we're looking at 15th century, and normally we talk about the Renaissance and the re associate Renaissance with Florence and that area, Tuscany, all those wonderful towns and cities that are immersed in beauty and in art. And last week, as you know, we were on our Dominican pilgrimage to, to Italy and looking from Assisi down on that splendid and awesome valley, a beautiful valley and one particular day it wasn't raining and it looked very beautiful. Then when we went to Siena, one day in Siena in the city, then the next day we went to a beautiful town called San Gimiano, just outside of Assisi. And again, the beauty there of the valleys and extraordinary. And I thought to myself, you know, what a place for artists to be inspired. And when we come to the offertory at the Mass, when we present the gifts, you know, we talk about fruits of the earth and work of human hands. And that's what artists used. The pigments they created from the earth, ground down stones and ground down, grounded earth, turned them into paint. There was a medium needed either with water or with, in the case of Jan van Eyck, with oil. And that was something very new in 1432. And Jan van Eyck and his brother and other Netherlandish artists were part of that northern renaissance as it known. So not only was this new beginning of art taking place down in Italy, but it was also moving up to these other countries, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, around there, and replaced a little bit what the Gothic, the later art was 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 very different and this particular painting is absolutely extraordinary for the quality of the artwork and the technique of those wonderful artists so just for a moment let me just be
This is probably the most stolen work of art in the world. And just to give you a few details about that. In 1432, this painting was unveiled in the Cathedral of St. Bavo in Ghent in Belgium. 1556, during a Protestant revolt, the painting was taken away and hidden in a tower in that cathedral. And then in 1574, the local council wanted to donate this painting to Queen Elizabeth I of England. 200 years later or so, in 1794, French soldiers take the central panels to Paris. And in 1815, these panels were returned to Ghent. The following year, in 1816, the side panels, with the exception of Adam and Eve, are sold and end up in Prussia. In 1914, the central panels are hidden. And six years later, in 1920, the painting is reconstructed. In 1934, panels eight, the just judges, you'll see it here, um, this one, it's on the open one of the altarpiece. So that's panel eight, which is the just judges, and panel 22, which is Saint John the Baptist, were stolen. Saint John the Baptist was returned, but the panel eight of the just judges was never found. And what's there today is a copy of that. And then in 1940, the painting is transferred to Pau in France, from where it was taken by the German forces, by Hitler and his army. And in 1946, the painting returned to Ghent. Then in 1986, the painting was moved to its present location in a special chapel in the cathedral in Ghent. So it has an amazing, an amazing history, but I suppose an amazing history and a story of survival. And like these polyptics or altarpieces, some of them were opened and some of them remained closed. This is an image of the altarpiece closed. So it would only really at that time have been opened for special feast days. The painting was commissioned by whose vid was his name and his wife, very wealthy merchants in Ghent. They were childless, they had no children in their family, they were great benefactors and great donors for the church. And that was something that was very popular and very important for people at that time, that they donated to the church, either a painting or a sculpture, but that was what they did in order to receive, you know, benefits and graces from the Lord because of their, their generosity. They are depicted down in the bottom here. He's on the left and his wife Elizabeth is on the right. Let's look at some details of this. That's them there. Both of them kneeling their hands joined in prayer, giving thanks to God really for the graces that they have received in their own lives. And you can tell by the way that Van Eyck has depicted them, depicted their clothes and their drapery, that they are very wealthy people. They're certainly not dressed as peasants. They are wealthy, wealthy merchants. This is the upper part of 
that closed panel. So in the center, you can see the scene of the Annunciation, the Archangel Gabriel and Mary. Above the Archangel Gabriel is the prophet Zechariah. Just above the Archangel Gabriel and above Mary is the prophet Micah. And both of those are holding scrolls with texts from their books. Zechariah, rejoice heart and soul, daughter of Zion. Shout for joy, daughter of Jerusalem. And then on the right hand side is the prophet Micah. He's looking down at the Blessed Virgin Mary and on the scroll behind him are the words from his prophecy, chapter five, verse two, from you will come for me a future ruler of Israel. And up in the center are the two sibyls, part of ancient Greek and Roman legend, the two sibyls who prophesied. The sibyl on the left is identified as the sibyl of Eritrea, and she has written behind her the words, his, speaking about the Archangel Gabriel, his words are not of mortal origin, but are inspired from on high. And then on the right is the other Sibyl of Kume. She's saying, the all-powerful king will come in human form to reign throughout all ages. And her prophecy was later transcribed by St. Augustine in the City of God. On the lower level, on your left, is the donor. On the far right is his wife, Elizabeth. Here, second to him, is St. John the Baptist, pointing to the Lamb, but carrying the Lamb in his arms. St. John the Baptist, Ecce Agnus Dei. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Beside him is Saint John the Evangelist, holding a chalice with a snake in it, so the poisoned chalice. And John the Baptist was asked to drink from this poisoned chalice as a test for his belief and for his faith and they thought that it would kill him but it didn't and that's why this is not really recorded in scriptures i think in the apocryphal gospels maybe but certainly it's been recorded by uh jacobo the voragine jacobus voragine who wrote the um the golden legend as it know as it's known a book that was used particularly in the Renaissance as a, a text very important for, for artists. And many of the artists referred to that and relied on it very heavily and painted exactly as he described the lives of these saints in his, in his book. A Dominican who was Archbishop of Genoa in the 13th century. Again, we look at that central panel of the Annunciation. Gabriel coming in to Our Lady and I think note the distance between them. Gabriel is over here on our left. Mary kneeling with her arms folded over on the right. You can see the dove of the Holy Spirit descending descending upon her, just over her head. And in between them is a scene from a room. And looking out from that room is that window, which depicts in the distance a scene from one of the streets in Ghent. And that's where Van Eyck uses this perspective 
which gives us this 3D dimension. And so looking out into the distance of Ghent. It's just a close-up of Zechariah. The two Sibyls and Micah. I often think the Sibyl on our right, you know, she probably today would be an influencer, I think, on social media. Just look at the way she's dressed and hasn't she got a waist to die for? <laughs> <laughs> and over on the right, the Prophet Micah. Here you have the window in that panel, and just to the right of that, a very ordinary detail of a towel and a basin. A towel to use for drying your hands, a basin for washing your hands. So that scene in the room with Mary, a depiction of daily life. And she has paused there in prayer to have this amazing and extraordinary experience of this encounter with the Archangel Gabriel, an encounter which would change the history of the world forever. That's just a close-up there of the, the arched window, typical of that period, looking out on a sunny Ghent with buildings there, and here in the corner, another little window in that niche in there, the towel, a lovely white towel hanging there and a basin. And Van Eyck used oil as his medium. So at that particular time, and particularly in, in, in initially and in Florentine painting, the medium was, you know, water really to, or egg. Egg was one. Water was used for frescoes an egg was used as the medium for mixing and binding together the, the pigments and paints. So we talk about egg tempera. So the painters used painting maybe on panel. They would um, have the pigment ground down. They would use the yolk of an egg to keep it together and paint it on that. It was extraordinary. But then that progressed into oil painting and with oil painting they were able to use that to create these wonderful effects of light and shadow and jewels and all that sort of stuff that came much paintings were much more alive with with that sort of light and reflection in the oil paintings particularly That's a picture of the altarpiece as it is today in that chapel in the Cathedral of St. Pavo. And that's it, opened. It's a huge painting, as you can see. 347 by 492 centimetres, so three and a half metres by four, nearly five metres wide. So it's a huge painting. And you can see that in this, these panels, there's much more light, there's much more colour. The closed uh, panels are very architecturally done and, you know, those statues there of John the Evangelist and John the Baptist are all, almost like as if there were statues sculpted, <coughs> he was able to create to create that the artist. No, this is oil. This is oil. Yeah.
So it's divided into various panels. If we begin over here on the left, the left on the right, extreme left and far right, is depicted Adam and Eve. The next to Adam is a group of musical angels playing and singing. In the center, this three figures is God in the center. Artists, art historians particularly are never in agreement of who it is. Is it Christ? Is it God the Father or is it the Holy Spirit or is it the, is it the Blessed Trinity? He's wearing a triple tiara there, you know, which could well be a reference to the Trinity, so God the Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. And on his left is the Blessed Virgin Mary, on his right actually, and, and over on the right, on his left is St. John the Baptist. Down in the bottom, from the left we have the just judges, the Knights of Christ, and that central panel, the adoration of the Lamb, Old and New Testament figures. The fountain is there very much in the forefront. The fountain with the water of life streaming from it. The Lamb of God, central there, standing on the altar. And the final two panels over on the right, the hermits and the pilgrims, all coming towards this wonderful new and heavenly Jerusalem to celebrate the victory of the Lamb. So Adam is over there on the left, and as you can see above him, Cain and Abel's, and they're offering to God. The angels singing, and over on the far right is Eve, and above her, a depiction of Cain killing his brother Abel. Beside that, an angel playing the organ, accompanying the singing of other angels, singing that new song, that new song to the Lord. And then in the central panel, God, Blessed Virgin, John the Baptist. And written there in some of the scripts, he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And look at the wonderful depiction of his robes and the drapes behind him. And there's a beautiful drape behind him with images on that of the pelican. The 
pelican associated with with Jesus and used by St. Thomas Aquinas that wonderful line in the Adoro Te Devote, you know, P.A. Pelicane, who feed the pelican who feeds young with its blood. And seated on the very bottom, I'm not sure if you can see it very clearly, is a crown, a beautiful crown at the feet of the Lord. His hands raised in blessing. His cloak beautifully closed there with a magnificent brooch. Wearing the triple tiara all done with wonderful jewels and gold. Over on our left, the Blessed Virgin Mary reading from a book. Mary pondered all these things and kept them in her heart. And as we heard this morning in our gospel, you know, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. St. John the Baptist, there he is pointing again, pointing towards God, the victorious Christ the one who saves and redeems us. It's just an image of the whole thing again. We've heard last night and this morning, you know, all those wonderful texts, particularly those scriptural texts about the Lamb of God and the victory of the Lamb. Wonderful text this morning from Father Paul, Eucharistic texts. And here we have it in this beautiful setting the adoration of the Lamb. I'm reminded of that wonderful prayer of Thomas Aquinas, the O Sacrum Convivium, that we say, O Sacred Banquet, in which Christ is received, the memory of his passion is renewed, soul is filled with grace, the pledge of future glory is given to us, past, present, and future. And here in this we have the angels at the back here behind the Lamb. You can see the cross holding there the instruments of his passion. You can see the pillar, the nails, the crown, everything is there. The memory of his passion is renewed. And all these great people taking part in this adoration of the Lamb. They are the ones who are now enjoying and have received that future glory that is promised to us. The Holy Spirit depicted at the very top of that panel, surrounded in this marvellous light. 
light coming down, spread out through this beautiful green and rich pasture. Eileen had you a question? They, that was begun by Hubert and he died and it was finished then by his brother Jan. Oh, it took quite a number of years. I think it was, it was finished in 1432, but it began sometime in the 1420s. Yeah, it would have taken quite a long time to get it all together. And even before that, you know, there would have been a lot of preparatory work so those artists would have had to work with a carpenter. The wood would have to be treated in a special way and <coughs> sanded down and cleaned and a type of a gypsum and gesso put onto it so in order that the, the paint would, would adhere to it and would stick to it. And that had all to, that it took time for it to dry. They had to mix all the colours. Yeah, it was... Put it all together and assemble it, maybe all together. Oh, so they did. Um, yes. Uh, that was British with the copper. Yeah. Or oh, that was really copper. That would have come from the east. It did indeed. That, that, that blue, lapis lazuli blue that they used, you know, particularly for these scenes, you know, was imported, yes, from Afghanistan, was the, 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 the main place. And in fact, lapis lazuli, you know, a precious stone that comes out of a rock. It's kind of, there are caves still today in Afghanistan. And the rock face is kind of grey, but there are these beautiful blue, deep, deep blue stripes going through it. So this would all have to be chiseled out of it, ground down. And then it was, it was imported from from these countries. In fact, it was more expensive than gold. Lapis lazuli was one of the most most expensive pigments. Yeah. Pardon me. Oh, they would have paid for us. Yes, mostly. Yeah. They would have had a say very much in what they wanted. Yeah, because they would have made a contract with the artist. And the donors would have stipulated, you know, very much. So obviously they wanted something huge and something big and something that would last, which it did, yeah. Yeah. And in this now you can see very clearly, I think, the you see the angels there with the the instruments of the passion, the cross, the pillar. And here, two angels with turables. This part is known as the adoration of the mystic lamb. So they're there adoring the lamb, standing on the altar victorious. In front of him is the fountain the water of life. And the book of Revelation talks about, you know, talks about people dressed in white, those who have conquered. The last few lines of that. Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. You have there the one seated on the throne. We saw that there. And here you have the lamb victorious on the altar.
close up there of the fountain. And you can see the beautiful vegetation and the flowers and all there in this fertile new Jerusalem. The water flowing out from there. Here is the water of life. And just again to read from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, where the author talks about the heavenly Jerusalem. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had disappeared now, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven as beautiful as a bride, all dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice call from the throne. You see this city, here God lives among men. He will make his home among them. They shall be his people and he will be their God. His name is God with them. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death and no more mourning or sadness. The world of the past has gone. I think it gives us great hope and great encouragement and sustains us on our journey. And that is certainly what the Eucharist does for us. It sustains us for our journey. But above all, I think it gives to us that pledge of future glory we see it here depicted by the Van Eyck brothers and it's something I think that all of us should look forward to, that one day we too hopefully will be there kneeling in front of the victorious Lamb when we can sing that wonderful song of God again. There's an amazing likeness, isn't there, to the lamb here, and that the one that is in the, the tableau here in Nahuk. And I doubt very much if any of those villagers had been to Ghent and that they saw this marvellous altarpiece of the misty lamb. It's extraordinary. And like the lamb here, you know, he's standing victorious but looking out at the people and you can see that he is the sacrificial lamb because just underneath him is a chalice on that altar with the blood flowing down into into that chalice. I think I have had finished. I think this is the last slide going up, so just in time. There's just one piece of music that let us all enjoy. That's it there. The face is almost human, isn't it? Now, I never looked that closely at a sheep for lamb, I don't know, but I don't think the face is like that. But there's an extraordinary beauty and the rays of light coming from his head and the blood flowing there into the chalice standing there victorious okay.
Thank you very much.